Hello, welcome back to my feminist research for my doctoral thesis, the title of which was Sex and Gender as Sources of Heterogeneity in British Attitudes and Behaviors. In the last chapter, I did what is commonly referred to as a, a literature review, and that is you have to demonstrate that you've read the literature, that you have found um, a gap in the research that needs to be addressed and the point of the thesis, if you're doing an empirical thesis as I did, is to identify the theories that have been used to explain the phenomenon that you're interested in, um, what is currently exists in terms of findings, where, where the gap is in those discoveries and how your thesis fills that gap. And in this next chapter, Measuring Gender, I start to address that issue of what it is about my research that is novel, new, and how it's going to make a contribution to our understanding of men and women's political behavior in the United Kingdom. Actually, more in Britain, because I don't deal with Northern Ireland, because Northern Ireland is a whole other thing. So we're going to be getting on now with Chapter 2, Measuring Gender. And again, I'm doing all of this in one take, so apologies in advance for any background noises or if I stumble over my words, anything like that. In the previous chapter, multiple theoretical frameworks from the American and British context were reviewed in order to provide an insight into the different ways of understanding pattern in men and women's political attitudes and behaviors. Political scientists clarified the two ways in which men and women's views might differ, appealing to either one, different attitudes toward the same issue, or two, the difference in the importance given to the issues which informed their vote choice patterns in men and women's different attitudes and issue salience might be influenced by three possible factors. The societal changes brought about by second wave feminism, women's increasing legal and economic autonomy and concomitant rise in economic vulnerability, or the socialization of men and women according to different worldviews achieved either in either childhood or adulthood socialization processes. One of the critiques presented in the previous chapter noted the lack in political science of any measures of an individual's gender as a separate concept from their biological category of sex. As previously mentioned, if being born a man, or, sorry, if being born a male or a female has an impact upon how an individual perceives the world and political events or situations, then the biological category of sex may contribute to a stable amount of the variance explained in the analysis of political attitudes and behaviors across nations and political systems. However, if being raised with, a, with specific norms of appropriate male or female behavior has an impact upon how an individual perceives politics, the social category of gender may also contribute to the variance explained in such analyses. In order to measure the concept of gender as distinct from sex, I conducted research into measures of gender employed in the field of psychology and incorporated them into an internet study of political attitudes and behaviors to understand if and when the differences in men and women's political preferences can be explained by a measure of the individual's gender as distinct from sex. A challenge presented to those who wish to investigate gender as a causal source of variation between and among men and women is how to operationalize a concept based in aggregate norms with, in, with individual level measures. Or to put it more in more plain language, if we agree that gender is the socially constructed norms of masculinity and femininity, how can we determine how feminine a specific person is? Does it make sense to try to evaluate societal gender norms individually? Social psychology continues to wrestle with this question. In this chapter, I present one method used to try to conceptualize and measure socially constructed gender norms on the individual level, the personal attributes questionnaire. The reader may recall that in the previous chapter, the concepts of agency and communion were linked with the concepts of masculinity and femininity. In this chapter, the concepts of agency and communion will be linked with the measures for masculinity and femininity, respectively. In addition, I will introduce an additional component when used, used when measuring gender called emotional vulnerability. To investigate the concepts of sex and gender as separate concepts, direct measures of masculinity and femininity were needed. In addition, tests of the internal validity of the gender measures were necessary in order to proceed with the analysis. 
In 2006, Dr. Rosie Campbell of Birkbeck College, University of London, received an ESRC grant to conduct an internet survey to uncover the sources of gender differences in men and women's political behaviors. I worked with Dr. Campbell on a previous qualitative project to investigate differences and similarities in men and women's political issues and attitudes during the 2005 British general election, Winters and Campbell 2007, Campbell and Winters 2006b. Later we discussed and agreed upon my participation on the internet study through the creation of a special project on measurement validity, which I headed. Working on this project allowed me the opportunity to develop separate and precise measures of gender beyond the sex variable currently used in political science's gender gap analysis. I turned to psychology, a field that has long, a long tradition of investigating the psychological components of gender. Two particular measurement instruments represent the most popular ways to measure gender, the BEM sex role inventory and the personal attributes questionnaire. Both formats were created as part of the same shift in perspective on gender roles that occurred in the 1970s. I will discuss the underlying concepts common to both questionnaires before moving on to address which of them I chose to employ and the rationale for my selection. Prior to the 1970s, psychologists generally presumed that an individual's biological sex, their gendered sex role, masculine or feminine, and their personal attributes and characteristics were bimodal. That is to say, the difference of the modal female and the modal male were distributed along a left-right spectrum with little overlap. At one end of the spectrum were men with their masculine roles and characteristics, while at the other end were clustered women, their feminine roles and characteristics. It was assumed by academics and researchers that there was a high correlation between an individual's display of sexually appropriate characteristics and their sex roles. For instance, a rough and rugged man would not be as nurturing a parent as the feminine mother. It was also assumed that an individual's sex, gender, and gender roles were bound together, positioned on either the male masculine side of the gender spectrum or on the female feminine. Displays of cross-sex behavior and attitudes were assumed in some sense to be pathological and had negative connotations. Those attitudes were challenged in the 1970s by investigators who began to demonstrate that men and women possess both masculine and feminine characteristics. Using methods of formal empirical research, Spence and Helmrich asked individuals to identify the socially desirable characteristics of men and women. This collection of attributes formed a basis of a core set of attributes for each sex. Derived from these collected attributes, accounts of the ideal woman would tend to use adjectives, quote, such uh, as emotional, sensitive, and concerned with others, while the ideal man is described with adjectives such as competitive, active, and independent, unquote. The idealized attributes for women are similar to Bakken's conception of communion, while the male attributes are related to Bakken's conception of agency, as mentioned in Chapter 1. This is not to say that the ideal woman possesses all communal and no agency traits, or that the ideal man has agentic and no communal characteristics, but rather that an ideal individual is characterized as possessing both in different degrees. So, for example, the ideal woman would be both minimally agentic, though not entirely non-agentic, and maximally communal. In addition, Bem made an important contribution to the investigation by including the concept of androgyny, quote, a self-concept that might allow an individual to freely engage in both masculine and feminine behaviors, unquote. The Bem sex role inventory and the personal attributes questionnaire both consist of a number of trait descriptions set upon a masculine bipolar scale and a bipolar feminine scale, with traits stereotypically differentiating the sexes. The BSRI contains 60 measures using a 7-point scale upon which respondents are asked to rate themselves. The PAQ short form cont contains 24 items with 5-point self-rating scales. Masculine characteristics, denoted by Spence and Helmrich as M, a shorthand I incorporate below, are identified as those characteristics that are present in both men and women, but believed to be more desirable in males than in females, for example, independence and competitiveness. Feminine characteristics, denoted by Spence and Helmrich as F, which I also use, contain characteristics that are considered socially desirable in men, but women are believed to be possessed, uh, but, but are believed to be possessed in greater degree by females. 
Finally, Spence and Helmrich included what they deemed the M-F scale to rate how socially desirable a characteristic is in males and in females. For instance, aggressiveness is judged desirable in males, but not in females. They note, quote, the content of the M and F scales turned out to support our theoretical preconceptions, the former containing items referred to instrumental agentic characteristics and the latter to expressive communal characteristics. The MF scale, however, contained both agentic and communal characteristics, many of the latter seeming to refer to emotional vulnerability, for example, feelings easily hurt. To determine whether gender was a bipolar measure, Spence and Helmreich, 1978, examined the correlations in the M and F scales. If gender was most appropriately measured on a bipolar scale, then the higher scores in the M scale should be related in the negative direction to the F scale. What they found, however, was that the correlations between the M and F scale were not only low, but positive in both men and women. This low correlation between scales of masculinity and femininity was also reported by BEM, 1974, using the BEM sex role inventory measures. The conclusions of these parallel investigations demonstrate that we cannot assume a relationship between being a woman and being feminine, nor between being a man and being masculine. Individual men and women possess both masculine and feminine characteristics in varying degrees, although the general trend is for men to score higher on masculine attributes and women to score higher on feminine ones. Further, the inclusion of the concept of androgyny allows males and females to both have a high sense of agency and a high sense of communion, while also including recognition of the undifferentiated individual, someone who possesses neither a high sense of agency nor a high sense of communion. Just a little pause here for a water break. <coughs> Although the BSRI and the PAQ can be used to measure gender, only the PAQ format was used for the internet survey and thus for this, and for this thesis. The decision not to use the BSRI was based on several considerations. First, the BEM sex role inventory contains 60 questions measuring two aspects, masculinity slash agency and femininity slash communion, while the original PAQ uses only 24 questions and measures three dimensions, M, masculine slash agency, F, femininity slash communion, and MF, which they call emotional vulnerability. Moreover, the PAQ, as will be seen later in this chapter, was it was possible to reduce the PAQ from 24 measures to 18. Considering the premium on question space in a large end survey, selecting from among 18 questions, which tap into three dimensions, is more parsimonious than selecting between 60 questions for two dimensions. Although the PAQ and BSRI both employ numerical scales, grounded in adjectives at each extreme end of the scale, the PAQ uses only five measures while the BSRI employs seven. Given that the scales are numerical, there is less ambiguity in a five-point scale than a seven-point scale, making the PAQ more suitable for an internet survey format. In addition, our attempts to replicate previous research required the use of the Personal Attributes Questionnaire for format. Sachin et al. 1994 used the PAQ as the method for determining the gender of their participants. In order to replicate their results, we used the same measures they employed in order to be able to engage in like-for-like -like comparison. Finally, research recently published on the PAQ suggested a refinement of the scale that allowed for a reduction in the necessary measures of gender from 24 to 18 by Ward et al. 2006, a summary of which is provided below. For all of the reasons given above, the PAQ was selected as a source from which new measures would be incorporated into the survey. Results of the Personal Attributes Questionnaire Spence and Helmrich, 1978, found that the self-reported PAQ scores collected from American college students revealed significant differences between the arithmetic means of men and women on each item. Each item was scored on a scale of 0 to 4, with the highest number correlating to the most masculine responses and 0 to the most feminine responses. Total scores were obtained by adding together an individual score on the masculine question set, the feminine question set, and the MF question set, with a possible range from 0 to 32. Men scored lower than women on F items and higher than women on M and MF items. 
the highest score on the MF scales was always in the direction of masculine traits, and the reverse scores occurred for women. Spence and Helmrich, 1978, in order to construct a method of combining scale scores, first determined the median scores on the M and F scales using the total sample scores with male and female respondents combined. Using cross-tabulation, Spence and Helmrich then classified individuals by using a 2x2 two two table of those who scored above the median and those who scored below in each category. Reproduced below is a replica of their schema for classifying individuals on the M and F scores by a median split. This distribution of men and women's scores across the various categories was more complex than the simple dichotomous operationalization of sex, male or female, as a proxy for gender would indicate. The percentage of college students falling into each of the four categories is reproduced below in Table 2.2, .2, reproduced from Spencer and Helmrich. So let me just take a pause here from uh, the reading to go over the results here. What, and in case that was a little too dense and heavy, what they basically did was they took the average, like, so if they had 50 people and the average of that group was 5, then anyone who scored 5 or above on their individual score was considered above median. And if you scored a 4 and the mean was, the average was 5, then you were, you were considered being below the median. And what they did then was to um, split out men and women's average scores. So this table, table 2.2, .2, from their sample, and this is reproduced from their study of a study of an, uh, with an N of a uh, number of cases of 715. You can see that um, for, for men, you've got the masculine here. Most men in the group, you've got um, scored high on masculinity, and then femininity is the, uh, the, the long way here, the cross. So those who scored, say, uh, below the median on masculinity and above the median on femininity, that was only eight men, shown right here. Whereas in terms of being masculine, men who scored below the median score for the group on femininity, and that includes men and women, and the masculine score were categorized as masculine. So basically what they're saying is that um, masculine traits are associated more often with male respondents and feminine traits, as you can see here, women who scored below the median on masculinity but above the median on femininity uh, classified as feminine, they made up the, the largest number of cases. So they're just basically saying their measures are uh, associated in the direction of sex. Helmrich, Spence, and Willem used a sample of high school students, college students, and parents. They found that the internal consistency reliabilities, Cronbach's alpha, alpha, for the M scale ranged from an alpha of 6.7 to 7.8 for males, high school students, college students, and parents, and from 7.1 to 7, sorry, 2.71 to 0.77 for female participants from the same group. Again, another aside, if you are looking for Cronbach's alpha, which is n one way to measure how good your measure is. In other words, is your measure measuring what you think it's measuring? The number that they recommend that your scale should achieve is 0 0.70. So you can see here that the, the male scores here range from 0 0.67, which is pretty close to 0 0.78, and then for women from 0 0.71 to 0 0.77. For the F scale, Cronbach's alpha ranged from an alpha of 0.72 to 0.80 for males and from 0.73 to 0.79 for females. The MF ranged from an alpha of 0.53 to 0.61 and from 0.61 to 0.65 for males and females respectively. According to Palant, the recommended score on the Cronbach's alpha coefficient should be equal to or higher than 0.7, which was achieved for both men and women's masculine and feminine measures. This evidence, wherein both men and women can be classified as masculine, feminine, androgynous, or undifferentiated, shows the serious, seriously flawed nature of the assumption that the dichotomous biological variable sex can be used as a proxy variable for the social construction of gender. At present, political science cannot estimate the difference in political preferences and attitudes between a woman who scores high on femininity and a woman who scores high on masculine measures. Neither can current political science explain the difference in preferences between a man who scores high on masculine measures and a man scoring high on feminine measures. Including direct measures of gender into a large N British political science internet survey instrument allowed for the inclusion of a large number of cases. 
As a result, the number of cases was large enough to allow investigation into the relationship between an individual's gender perspective and their political preferences while controlling for the explanatory power of sex, age, education, and other relevant demographic variables. And I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Why don't we stop here and I will um, set this up a little bit and in the next section I explain the selection of the measures I incorporated into the internet study. And I do that by looking at a piece of research that made the scales, at least with using American college students, more efficient and allowed uh, me to drop out some possible questions to choose from in terms of re reproducing or replicating this, this instrument in a British context when it's previously been used, I think except for one time, in an American context. So that's uh, where we're going to pick up next time is how are we going to measure gender and how do we know our measures are reliable. So thanks for listening guys. I do appreciate it. I've been Christy. You've been awesome. We'll talk to you.